And welcome to another episode of Living with FASD, an informational and human interest show for those affected by prenatal exposure to alcohol, their loved ones, and anyone else interested in learning more about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Brought to you by your host, Patty Casper, your FASD coach with both professional and living experience with FASD. And today, I am delighted to bring to you Patrick Bross, who is um, in our community of adults living with FASD. And I stumbled upon Patrick in a Facebook post uh, last week, and I'm just absolutely delighted to make his acquaintance. And I think that he will inspire you um, if you're living with FASD, or he will inspire you to have hope if you're a parent of a kiddo with FASD. So without any further ado, Patrick, would you please introduce yourself to our listeners or viewers and and just tell us, you know, give us a, a summary of what's going on in your life these days. Hi, I am Patrick. Um, I am 30 years old. I uh, am diagnosed with an FASD. Uh, when I was very young, my mother took me to uh, what we have here, which is the DeVos Children's Hospital uh, FASD clinic. And I was diagnosed, uh, I'm from Michigan, uh, with CAT3 or PFAS, which is basically has less of the facial features, but it does have a lot of the all the same symptoms of FAS, mm -hmm. uh, which at the time there wasn't really FASD. They had different categories. So depending on that, now we just categorize everything under the FASD, similar to how autism switched from autism to ASD, FASD switched from that, because there used to be other terms too that are no longer in use. Right. Um, I work full-time as an informational uh, technology specialist. I'm working towards becoming a network engineer. Um, and I'm also on the board for MC Fairs, which is run by a very awesome lady by the name of Emily. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's really cool. And she runs the Michigan FASD group. Um, I have uh, I'm pretty uh, self-aware of my diagnosis. I'm very educated on the topic and I look forward to our conversations. Yeah. Awesome. So you said you were very young when you were diagnosed. How Correct. how old were you? I want to say, uh, let's see, eight or nine. Now, note in the CPS, the original CPS reports back in 1995. So I was born in 93. Um, uh, they were convinced that I had prenatal alcohol exposure just written in there. So okay. there was, they were, even though it wasn't as common or as known about, it was severe enough. I mean, I was, uh, pretty bad off. My mother was a heavy drinker, uh, mm -hmm. and she did other stuff too, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was then, probably a bad case scenario for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, but that's so often the case, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, it just a lot of the adverse childhood experiences, they all kind of glump and, you know, they run together um, for so many of us. Mm -hmm. um, so how, so you were eight or nine when you went to the hospital. So you knew something was up. How, how did your parents or was it the professionals that broke it down for you and um, explained what was going on? Well, I'm going to be honest. There was a lot sure. of misinformation. And uh -huh. a lot of uh, incorrect assumptions based on a lot of bias. Um, I had anger episodes. I don't have those anymore, actually, at all. But okay. I would get I would get really frustrated for small reasons. Um, I was also incredibly skinny. I still am, but I'm nowhere near as skinny as I was when I was little. And there was a lot of. Uh, my mother was informed, I think at the time she met a wonderful lady by the name of Barbara Wybrick, somewhere around that point, and uh, she also got some information from her, and her information was helpful. Granted, there still wasn't a lot known at the time. Yeah. So my parents were told, raise him like he was just any other kid. It did not go well. Oh. By no. a lot of people. Yeah. 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 That's a horrible idea. Yeah. Um, a lot of my development happened after age like 22. Okay. A lot of my ability to learn how to control things. And it was because I got the proper information. Now, yeah. if a kiddo got that information earlier on, it might even turn out better than me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It really depends on both the parent and the child. It's mm -hmm. a mix of both. It's going to take two to win this. It's going to yeah. take two people, two groups of people to get through it. Yeah. It's not just one. Yeah. It's a big common misconception. My kid's just not trying. Well, 
it, it's a, it's it's not just the kid. The kid can try yeah. if you don't put towards effort. The kid's not going to get anywhere. And if yeah. the kid's trying and you don't put any effort, the kid's also not going to get anywhere. Right, right. You are so is. right. Yeah. And, you know, I see that all the time with my work in foster care, um, you know, where the parents have the, uh, the well-intended bad idea that, mm -hmm. you know, our love alone is going to get this kiddo where they need to be. And, oh. you know, it's wishful thinking. No. Yeah, I'm not going to give any names, but I was talking to a parent um, not that long ago about their kid, and I was recommending, hey, you know, why don't you bring them to uh, get some testing done? And then mm -hmm. the father was like, Sh -sh -sh we don't want to, we don't want to talk in front of the kid about it. And I said, why? And they're like, well, because some people start using it as an excuse, and I really hate that term. I really hate it when parents do that because parents are pushing back the kid and acting yeah. as if it's not a real uh, reason. I like to use right. the. Right. Uh, Ar uh, arm or limb analogy, right? If mm -hmm. you chop off someone's arm, you can't expect them to use that arm. Right. But what you can expect them to do is to learn how to pick up stuff with their feet, pick yeah. up stuff with their hands. It's about approaching yeah. the situation differently than yeah. what's expected. It's not that they can't do the task. It's that they can't, do, they're not able to do it the way that you're expecting them to. Exactly. And that is, that is just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate that analogy. Um, what were what were if you don't mind my asking what were some of the other misinformation uh, or misguided techniques that they told your parents to use? Okay, um, honestly, it was just very much so. A lot of it was they okay. So the problem is, is my parents are super religious, and they mm -hmm. told my parents to treat me as if I was any other kid that they would have. Well, according to their religious group, their form of uh, punishment is screaming and hitting. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, um, and a lot of parents, and this is the big thing, they said just to correct. Well, the problem is, is if you tell certain parents that you're just supposed to correct their kids, what a lot of parents don't understand is the difference between teaching your child and telling them what to think. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my favorite analogies for this is, let's say we're in a school classroom, right? We're doing math. What is the number one thing that a teacher wants you to do in math class? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? Listen. <laughs> no, it's not the most important thing. Show your work. Do you know why yes. that is? Because you're not teaching them. You can tell them yeah. the answers until you're blue in the face. Yeah. But you're teaching them how to solve it. the problem. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a big difference between telling someone what to think and yeah. teaching them how to find the answers to what to think. Yeah. yeah. A lot of parents get that wrong. A lot of parents think that I'm teaching my child by telling them what's right. Yeah. But the truth is, is, is that's not what you should be doing. It. You yeah. have to model it. You have to show through your actions and also yeah. give them the roadblocks, give them the pieces of the puzzle yeah. and have them figure that out because it'll yeah. stick with the child more. Yeah. Yeah. And it not only will, because once they figure that out, it's going to be more rewarding for them and you're going to mm -hmm. be happier off. You can still, what a lot of parents don't understand is you can still get the same results you're looking for with a lot of less of the negatives mm -hmm. if you just model it correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, yeah. That can, I mean, that's true for so very many things, right? Um, so you you said you you kind of caught up, you know, with your your development, being able to figure things out, and um, once you hit twenty two, what happened at twenty two that turned the corner for you? Your sound went out. You hit mute. I didn't think I did. My <laughs> mouse was over here. Okay. Um, anyway, so a lot of it is, is social media mm -hmm. and educating myself. Um, mm -hmm. I got into contact with the right people and honestly learning about FASD and the symptoms mm -hmm. and approaching it, um, learning why, the why. Yeah. I had to understand the why. Why am I yeah. doing this? Why am I thinking this way? Why am I reacting this way? What is the result I want and how do I get there? Yeah, that's the that was the approach I took. Um, and, you know, I've always been pretty sure of what I wanted to do in life. Um, mm -hmm. And I learned that I needed to accept that my thinking is was flawed. 
Mm-hmm. I had at the end of the day, I had to accept that no matter what I do, my even if my intentions are great and wonderful, at the end of the day, my thinking of how to approach a problem wasn't working. Okay. So I start asking questions. I ask people, hey, I would message Miss Emily all the time. And she introduced me to a friend. Her name's Josie. And I'd message her. Uh, she, uh, I'd ask other people, hey, this is the situation I'm in. This is what I'm wanting to say. This is what I'm wanting to do. How should I approach this better? And mm-hmm. that system right there helped me drastically. Yeah. Learning that, yeah. feeling safe enough with someone to ask them a yeah. question and to figure, I still call up Miss Emily to this day. She's a wonderful lady. I don't know if you've talked to her. I have not, not yet. Okay. So she re- leads the Michigan group. I believe she's in Flying with Broken Wings as well. She's a wonderful okay. lady. Um, okay. She's the head of MC Fairs in Michigan, uh, okay. one of the heads. And uh, anyways, I'll still call her up to this day and tell her, hey, this is the situation I'm in. Keep- You're on- Am I pressing a, I must be pressing a, sh- oh, I'm pressing the space bar on accident yeah. when I'm talking. Okay. <laughs> that explains it. Um, but basically, uh, that was a big help. It's yeah. having the guidance, but also yeah. it did come down to me accepting that I don't want to live like this too. Yeah. That's yeah. really hard for a kid. And a yeah. lot of parents need to adjust their expectations a bit sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what one thing that you kind of pegged on is, is so very critical and that's having someone that you feel safe with Mm -hmm. in your corner right um and that's something you did not have when you were a youth that that felt safety right yes when it wasn't discipline it was punishment Mm -hmm. which ramps up your anxiety which really shuts down any cognitive abilities Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also don't want, one of the things I worry about sometimes when I share my situation is expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think to an extent that if you're. Yeah, mute again. I keep pressing the space bar when I'm talking. I'm going to like push my keyboard up. I, I move my hands a, a lot idea. when I talk. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things I, I want parents to understand is. Don't expect your child to end up as an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. Be happy Mm -hmm. if they can hold a full-time job at McDonald's or the Mm -hmm. supermarket. Because you got to understand your kid, not what someone else's kid is doing, not what Patrick is doing, not what someone else in the FASD group is doing. Set goals. Short-term goals are great. Um, And have that conversation with your kid. I see this a lot where parents will be like, I want my kid to do this or do that. But what does your kid want? Because you can, let's say that they just like, talking get them a youtube channel you can make it safe Mm -hmm. get them a get them a Mm -hmm. don't let you know you don't have to have them show their face have them do what they love because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day they're going to put more effort into it you know they like riding bikes okay make a show uh make a thing on youtube about riding, especially if they can't deal with other people because there's a lot of kids that just aren't able to deal with authority figures i'm pretty bad at it myself to be honest with you but (laughs) i i i I can mask long enough to survive and i only see my boss once a week so uh (laughs) at at the uh at the end of the day um it's about figuring out what your kid's good at you know Mm -hmm. they like to they like to fiddle with things create things have have them make jewelry have them do something sell it on ebay they won't be making uh, top dollar but they'll be doing something productive and they'll enjoy it yeah um and that's and 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 a lot of people say oh well i have to do this this and this and be like okay well how can we get there yeah And, and i think that is one of the keys right is for parents to really question what does success truly what does success look like mm-hmm. because it looks different for everybody yeah right and what <clears throat> you know back in the back in the 70s there was a book it was already a classic in like vocational training circles called what color is your parachute and the premise of the book was pretty basic and it's how to find an avocation rather than a mm-hmm. vocation right yeah. finding taking what you love to do, all the things that bring you enjoyment and figuring out a way to make money at it Mm -hmm. so that you want to go to work every day, right? And And you want to stay focused. Mm -hmm. And that's really critical for those of us who are not on the college track, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so many degrees out, the college track isn't, it's not worth what it used to be anyway. 
I make more than everyone I know who went to college. Yeah. Just saying that right now. I, uh, yeah. I have friends who went to college and they make like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, this economy is not doing too well. No. Um, but yeah. at, at the end of the day, you're always going to have someone who is making more, even in FASD, you know, not, you know, I'm just because you see me driving around in my sports car doesn't mean you're going to be. Yeah. And it's the expectation. And honestly, you don't need one. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. a, it's a money sink, but it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm dying of curiosity. What sports car do you have? 2023 Mustang Ford Mustang. It's white go. with a black trim and it's the premium version. It nice. was really fun. Um, nice. Yep. So <clears throat> you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, years ago, like, oh, I don't know, 20, 20, 22 years ago, maybe. Um, when I had been made a supervisor where I worked at the time, mm. every quarter we had super, we had regional supervisor meetings mm -hmm. and we would have to drive to another office, like, I don't know, four and a half hours away for a two hour meeting and drive back again. And they had an icebreaker and it was, what is your fantasy car? Mm -hmm. Right. And so we go around the room and the people are saying like Lamborghini and, you know, all these super high dollar sports cars. <laughs> and I said, I want a Winnebago. <laughs> so I wouldn't want a Lambo because of the cost. You get a scratch on there. That's 10 grand just for yeah. like a small little dent or scratch. It, it's yeah. ridiculous. <clears throat> yeah. But I, everyone was like, a Winnebago. <laughs> You're not in our class. you know. And I'm like, well, I, I already have, a, I had a Volkswagen Passat at the time, and that was sporty enough for me, right? So it's like, yeah, I, I, I want to travel in comfort. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. So just at least at that point in life, I didn't yet know that I was on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But at least at that point in life, I was comfortable being very different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I had some friends give me a hard time. They're like, you should have got a Dodge. And I'm like, you do realize that the people that get Dodges are either stolen or the only reason they don't crash is because they're uh, repoed before they crash them. Mm. Okay. I had not heard those things. Uh, I <laughs> mostly was giving them a hard time yeah. because they're, but yeah. I'm not a big fan of trucks though. That's for sure. Yeah. So Patrick, how did you land where you are now in terms of your career? How, how did you, how did you stumble into that? How did you make that happen? Well, I didn't exactly stumble into it. I've okay. been doing this sort of stuff since I was eight years old. Um, so okay. I've been taking apart, my mother gave me a, back in the day, now some, anyone who's younger than me watching this might not know what this is but we used to have old nokia cell phones that were mm -hmm. like black and white my mom had hers break she brought it to verizon um and they're like i don't never work again she gave it to little patrick as a toy i took it apart and i put it back together and, and it, it started worked. working yep <laughs> and then um and i was eight it's not that impressive to me now as an adult but for an eight-year-old especially the older phones which are harder to yeah. disassemble I was pretty impressive and then um I kind of just fell in love with this stuff growing up and then okay. when I was 18 I got a job as an intern um refurbishing dolls non-paid um I kind of fell into depression a little bit after that so and I kind of just worked for myself odd jobs mm -hmm. for a long time mm -hmm. and then uh, a few years ago I got a job as a repair technician and uh, I accidentally became one of the top like 10 in the country. Okay. So on their uh, statistics and metrics. And then I applied for an IT position um, at a corporate office here and uh, I got it. There's no competition. That's and awesome. They're paying for my certifications and stuff. And that was so, a little over a year ago. And now okay. I'm working towards getting certifications so I can become a network engineer. That's awesome. Well done. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just one thing that demonstrates how different we are within mm -hmm. the, the family of FASD, right? Because that's not my wheelhouse at all. <laughs> and when I, when I moved here to California 24 years ago, people would ask me their tech questions with 
the computer system and I was able to help. But my pace of learning and growing <laughs> seems to be retro compared to the pace of the field in development, right? So yeah, I can't keep up. <laughs> so I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> Okay, what um, you had some advice on the page we were on, you know, and it was towards a it was towards a mom. So you know, we've kind of been talking about that. Are there there any other things that you wish parents understood? Hmm. Um, probably uh, that they can be wrong. Hmm. A lot of parents don't want to accept that they're wrong. And yeah. a lot of parents think that they have this mindset where if something goes wrong, it's the kid's fault. If something goes right, it's their, 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 they are the they reason. They take credit. Yes, yeah. they take credit. Yeah. Any sort of improvement that your child has, 50% of it is on them, at least mm -hmm. at the bare minimum, if mm -hmm. not 100, especially if you're making the wrong choices. And yeah. I can tell you what, if you ignore the advice in the group, a lot of the times, a hundred percent of that's on your kids. Any improvement, mm -hmm. you should. There is, humans are not like people think. Let me rephrase that, okay? Um, your entire personality, every choice you make, every word you say, is based on a few features, a few things. Your personality, everything, nature and nurture. FAS can be chalked up to nature to an extent, kind of. It's it's, it's definitely a, I don't, I don't want to say, um, uh, a human modified nature, but it, it's part of who you yeah. are when you're born, yeah. okay? Yeah. Every single choice you make is based on that, on your nature and on your nurture, the groups you're mm -hmm. invited. Kids don't make decisions, really. Right. Their entire personality, how they're interacting with the world is solely based on you and their genes, mm -hmm. what they're born with, and also the schools you put them to, the people that you're that they're surrounding to. Yeah. If they get bad influences of school, that's on you as a parent. You put them to mm -hmm. that school. If they mm -hmm. get if they're repeating stuff you said, that's on you. A lot of parents seem to think that their kids are just born evil and trying to cause mm -hmm. havoc for them. No, there's an underlying yeah. reason. Kids don't wake up and decide that yeah. they want to be little monsters. Yeah. It's yeah. it's the parents' fault yeah. in a lot of the cases. And a lot of parents don't like hearing that at all. They hate hearing it because, yeah. oh, it can't be me. My parents raised me this way and I'm fine. No, it, it's you. You are the yeah. problem. Well, I think <clears throat> I kind of, one of the things I appreciate about what you just said is, you know, that nature nurture balance because the alcohol very much hardwires the damage, not mm -hmm. only in our brains, but also throughout our bodies, right? Mm -hmm. So it very much is nature, mm -hmm. but nurturing or the lack of it Correct. definitely brings to bear all the secondary disabilities that we face. Well, and also right? if you take into account a lot of people like myself in the FASD community are adopted. All mm -hmm. right. So let's, we can accept that as truth, right? Now, if we take into account that the most important part of a child's development is in the first few years, yeah, the first couple of years. So if that child's not being held, not being fed, yeah. um, you know, not being taken care of, that child is going to be damaged whether you like it or not. There's nothing yeah. at that point that you can do. And right. there's going to be behaviors that you don't like. If you cannot accept that, you probably shouldn't be adopting Yeah, at all. Like, and that's just something that parents need to accept when you adopt, I think personally, if I had my way about it, when you adopt a child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, there needs to be uh, information given at that point before you even meet the kid and mm -hmm. be like, this is what you are going to deal with. You need to understand yeah. this and accept that. And the ch yeah. parents should go through a huge interview process and everything, because I think that it is very, very important that they get put yeah. in the best possible situation for them. Yeah. And not, not only interviewing, but also training. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I would say as being someone that does both of those things, mm -hmm. right. Training and interviewing, <clears throat> excuse me, it needs to be over a longer period of time, mm -hmm. not rushed into a one or two week process. Yes. So definitely. that you can, you know, fill the beds. Because, right? and this might upset a lot of people, but I've had a lot of parents in the group 
where they're like immediate responses. I want to send this child to a home. I need to get them out of the house. Yeah. If, in my personal opinion, this is probably going to upset a lot of people. If you are at the point where you're sending your child to a foster care home or back to foster care, you were a failure as a parent. That is, I'm sorry if that's controversial, but oh. at that point, you did not. I, I did it again. Didn't I? No, I didn't. No, uh, I you're switched fine. to full screen. You did not <laughs> educate yourself enough yeah. to know what you were getting into. You yeah. did not parent the correct way. You tried yeah. to parent probably similar to how you traditionally, mm -hmm. which won't work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a huge problem. And it upsets me because I don't want the kids to be hurt. I want them to be in yeah. a safe environment. And I don't yeah. want one of the reasons I like to speak out is, is because I don't want a kid to go through what I went through. Yeah. all ever yeah and um, i think that's what motivates so many of us right yeah. um you know but the bottom line is none of us knew what we didn't know Correct. until we actually learn it mm -hmm. um, and that's why we i want to spread yeah so word. we have we have to give grace to everybody um we cannot go back retroactively and prepare parents yeah um so if they're currently in a place where they're wanting to give up um, they need our compassion also, <clears throat> um, because, you know, judgment doesn't help kids do better and it doesn't help parents do better. That's fair. I just get yeah. really passionate and emotional about that. Yeah. It, it does yeah. upset me. Yeah. And, so and, I'm and sorry with good reason. That. I totally get that. Yeah. I totally get that. I'll um, <clears throat> but you know, I working in the foster care system for 24 years mm. um the reality is there's so much information to share mm -hmm. that parents get flooded and after a while it's everything's in one ear and out the other right yeah that's um, true and it needs to be revisited often just just like with us as people living with fasd that need lessons repeated again and again um, the same thing holds true with parents who are, um, who have not been well prepared to mm -hmm. take on the challenges that they are, um, you know, what's it, your, oops, I interrupted you. Oh no, go ahead. What's your opinion on older parents adopting young kids? Like, and I'm talking 50s, 60s, 70s. <sighs> well, I, I can't say that I've never done an assessment for geriatric caregivers. I have. For the most part, they've been kin, right? Mm -hmm. Grandparents, great-grandparents. And there's that network of other people who will step up. So right? I was adopted by very old parents. Yeah. And I want to say that added a lot of other things. And yeah. they loved yeah. me. And I know they loved me. Yeah. Do I think that they made the best decisions probably not do yeah. i think that they were given improper information a hundred percent do i think their yeah. style of parenting was very much so old school old school and not yeah. the best yes yeah um do i think that um uh, and then on top of that now i'm dealing with them slowly dying and it's painful yeah it's painful to watch they're very old and it, and it hurts because i do love them even though I don't agree with them on everything I love them very much yeah. and that's hurt, harmful and, and that's what and, I was going to ask is where is your relationship now is there have have they engaged with you in conversations about that? I don't yeah. think they like hearing about FASD to be honest with you okay. because they feel that when I bring it up I'm explaining to them what they did wrong and they don't like to accept that they did anything yeah. wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. which I don't blame them for. Uh, but the problem is, is a lot of the way that the older people think is heavily flawed to begin with. So, yeah. um, yeah. I'm not yeah. a big fan of some of the attitudes of that, the silent and boomer generation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I totally, I'm totally with you. And supporting you from afar with the um, the sentiments of it. It's hard well, to watch your parents dying, right? Because my mom's yeah. 91 mm -hmm. and I'm her full-time caregiver. 
So one of and the things hard. too that I parents need to take into account when thinking of adoption mm -hmm. is just your goal as a parent is to help mm -hmm. them function in today's society, not society 20 years ago, not yeah. society 30 years ago. Yeah. And if you yeah. cannot adapt to know what's socially acceptable now versus what was socially acceptable 20 years ago, you probably shouldn't parent. Yeah. Because well, your child's going <laughs> to crash and burn. Because if you teach yeah. them values that aren't really held, because I can't tell you what, how many times I've said yes, ma'am, to a person and they've gotten mm -hmm. heavily offended because that's how I was taught to speak. Yeah. I was told for 20 years that that's respectful. Yeah. And the problem is, is when I'm adapting that to today's society, uh, I'm yeah. messing up and it's not even intentional. I yeah. have no problem mm -hmm. respecting other things and stuff, but yeah. I'm so used to it because I've had yeah. it engraved in me that that's what, how you're supposed to talk to someone yeah. Yeah. that now it's making it difficult for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and, and so much of that is regional too, Patrick, because mm -hmm. down South, it's still yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Mm hmm Right. Although there are pockets like when I moved to Virginia, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I'll never forget the first time, you know, women have a, a an appointment they have to get every year. Right. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that at that particular office, they didn't ma'am any anybody. They missed everyone. Right. Miss mm -hmm. so and so miss so and so. And I'm thinking, wow, all these pregnant ladies can't be single. <laughs> So there, there are regional factors that mm -hmm. can throw you for a fruit loop, yep. but, but, you know, and, and I think as far as things being socially acceptable, that does change over time. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are still the, the values underneath can be enduring, right. That value of respect, the way respect is expressed may change. But the giving of respect, that's not going anywhere. That will always be appreciated. I right? guess. I yeah. still think that people, there should be a generation gap rule. <laughs> like you shouldn't be able to. That's my personal opinion, though. Yeah. But I, yeah. I strongly, uh, I would have preferred to have younger yeah. parents that could be there yeah. for me longer and kind of be but I was basically part of the reason I think I pushed myself so hard too is because I knew that you know 10 10 years down the line my parents aren't going to be around mm -hmm. I'm not going to have any safety net any family yeah. no one to be there for me so I oh. have to get myself on foot quickly too and that yeah. kind of was a big motivator for me to kind of step yeah. up and learn everything myself that um, is that's hugely motivating isn't it and mm -hmm. and but that worked well with your skill set mm -hmm. and with your personality right mm -hmm. because there are those of us under this FASD umbrella mm -hmm. who will <clears throat> never be independent right interdependence is all they have to hope for and if they have an elderly parent you know, that's such a huge burden on the parent. Yeah. Who's going to be there for my kids when I am gone? Yep. It's, it's huge. Probably, I'm going to be honest with you, it's really grim right now. If things keep going on how it is, if you are an elderly parent with a child with FASD, chances are in about 10 years from now, your child will be in a small home uh, being taken advantage of and eating moldy bread. Just going to be mm. honest, based on some of the foster care homes that I'm aware of that exist in, a, in the, my state of Michigan, your child will suffer and probably die very young because mm -hmm. due to a malnourishment or mm -hmm. food poisoning. Um, thankfully, I'm never going to have to deal with that. Yeah. So, but mm -hmm. your child, on the other hand, chances are statistically, uh, it's a good probability. Yeah. And that's why we need to change the system. We need yeah. to change how things work. And also while parents who have younger kids, if you don't want that outcome, there's a lot of changes that you can make that can mm -hmm. at least help to an extent. And, yeah. uh, and, and I think one of those changes is what you, you already said is, is get up to date with what you know about FASD. Yeah. Right. And and another one would be absolutely have that, excuse me, neuropsych assessment or or if you can't afford that, go through the facets exploration tool mm -hmm. that even that tool <clears throat> um, will give you a good idea of the particular strengths and challenges mm -hmm. and be able to put in creative um, accommodations 
right? To build upon their strengths, to maximize um, their their outcomes. Um, you know, that's absolutely crucial to understand your child for who they are, what makes them tick, you know, and your child could be your age or my age. We're still children. <laughs> and there's still times when, you know, it's nice to bounce ideas off mom or dad. You know, parenting doesn't end at 18. It just changes form. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And that's a big misconception I see with parents. This is what are they going to do when they hit 18? And I'm like, that's the least of your worries. You should be wondering yeah. what they're going to do at 30 or 40. You're going to be stuck with mm -hmm. it. They're not going to be independent at 18. And if you have that yeah. expectation, and I, I'm not sure there might be one or two, but if you have that expectation for your kid, you have wrong expectations. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the uh, things that I see a lot with just people in general, and this is something that I probably pointed out multiple times, just secondhand is and I know I mentioned expectations, but it's more or less like people are either too positive or too negative. Mm -hmm. So you have parents that are like, oh, my kid's going to be all out on their own and completely OK, no issues. And then you have parents that are like, my kid's going to be under 24-7 care forever and mm -hmm. I'm doomed. Um, realistically, yeah. we're all if you <laughs> if you have those expectations, yeah. Yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point. Yeah. yeah, you're you're just setting yourself up. Or yeah. defeat, and We're that's just how it's gonna up. be. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. So <clears throat> we we were before we started recording. We talked about how there are um, there's a lot of statistics out there for the difficulties and the challenges that we may succumb to. Right, like you know, sixty one percent of high school kids will have repeated suspensions or expulsions high school dropout, right? There's that whole school to prison pipeline. There's, you know, I, I know here in California, one third of the, of the homeless population is thought to have FASD. The prison population um, internationally is hugely weighted uh, with those who have an FASD that may or may never have been diagnosed. Um, there are a lot of, you know, and let's not forget the, your life expectancy is 34. Well, that's a, <laughs> you have to take that with a grain of salt. Well, yeah, because it was one study and it was a small study and the people in that study had never been given the supports they needed. Correct. Yeah. So, um, so there's a lot of stats out there, but we, any one of us can defy all those statistics. Well, right? we'll check in four years. <laughs> well, I can I can tell you <clears throat> that um Well you're only 32, right? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm 60. Nah, so, I don't believe you. I'm 60. Young lady, I'm gonna have to see some identification. <laughs> I just turned 60. Um oh. and I'll tell you, Patrick, when I was interviewing people for my book. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that I have met just this past year who never knew they had FASD until they were in their 40s and 50s. Yep. And I know there's a lot of people like in the group that are well over that. Uh, mm -hmm. RJ is definitely significantly older than me. Um, yeah. I know that I don't know if you know who what Rob Wybrick is. He's also mm -hmm. like 50 or something or 40 or something. Yeah. His uh, I mentioned his mother earlier, Barbara, yeah. but there's a lot of people yeah. that are older with FASD. Yeah. So, yeah. again, I'm not putting much stock into it. And even if it was yeah. a statistic, it wouldn't be the first statistic I broke. So it won't right? be the last. Right. Um, so, yeah, I've I've outlived my expiration date uh, quite a bit. So, um, and I've been defying that on, on many ends because my pediatrician um, <clears throat> told my parents uh, because I was diagnosed so young with type one diabetes that I, they would be lucky if I lived to eight. And I, mm -hmm. if I saw my teenage years, they really needed to be grateful. Mm -hmm. um, and if I outlived my teenage years, I would be a brain dead vegetable. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I have outlived my expiration date by a hell of a long time. So, oh yeah, we can defy statistics. Yeah, hey, you're basically uh, that uh the 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 college pizza in the fridge that just seems to be good for a couple months. 
<laughs> Sorry, that was just a random thought. I'm a McDonald's thought. hamburger. <laughs> yeah, you can't go mad. Um. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sometimes my humor is just out of. No, I love there. it. I love that. So, um, in, in fact, I had a conversation with Jen Wisdall, Wisdall at mm -hmm. FASD United, mm -hmm. and I told her that um, FASD United has to create T-shirts that says hashtag Beyond Thirty Four. Mm -hmm. I would, I would so get one of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, you know, I think when when it comes on a more serious note, though, when it comes to the expectations that people have for their children or their loved ones, um, they're often set by that misinformation, right? Mm -hmm. And Definitely. not everything on Google is accurate, right? Like case in yeah. point, 34 years life expectancy. Yeah, um, that's so... <clears throat> Yeah. And yeah. you also have to take into account anything like that, even if it was a larger study, would include babies that die at childbirth. Uh, mm -hmm. It would include um, yeah. it, uh, kids uh, getting themselves hurt or yeah. it, the problem is, is there's too many factors into a death. It right. can't just right. be because of it's a disorder. You can't just take it into account. I mean it just it wouldn't be i know many neurological kids that didn't make it to mm -hmm. 18 let alone that yeah so yeah again to, to your point there's a difference of dying with something and dying from that thing correct yeah. yeah um i mean there are things that i have done which could have easily gotten me killed yeah. um for legal reasons uh i went really fast in my car uh really really fast I for, legal reasons, that was it. Uh, for legal reasons, <laughs> I'm not going to, on a podcast, <clears throat> give us any details. Speed. If you're a police officer, and you're welcome to try to figure that out and guess. You're welcome to. If you get the exact number, I will happily take the ticket. But um, uh, I, I went really, really fast in the country. No yeah. cars, just yeah, nothing in the road. So I know nobody saw either. But basically, yeah, yeah if I was to get hit at that the speed, I'd, I'd be dead. Yeah. So like, and I've Please done stuff like do that, that but I won't, I already got a lecture from my dad about that. Um, really I'm just meeting lecture. you and the world would be a dimmer place without you in it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you might need a, just, just get a, just get a giant like uh, light. Everything's okay. I'm going to dim a little bit, but I'm sure like a little bulb would uh, lighten things up. Well, I, I think, you know, it, those of us on the spectrum can do some things that are incredibly stupid that yeah. get us lectures from parents, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm I'm grateful when I was the age you probably were when you did that, um, they didn't have cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so there was no way of my mom knowing where I was. <laughs> was your car break down or something? Um, well, <clears throat> let's just say that I, um, you know, I started college when I was 16 academically i was ready but socially yeah not even a neurotypical seven or 16 year old is not ready for college i'm just saying that's why i kind of failed out slash dropped out of college yeah yeah I but it was it was the yuppie version of running away from home and so that's what i did mm -hmm. um but i i had zero skills at reading people's intent i had zero you got ripped skills. off didn't you um I just put myself in many vulnerable positions. Um, and as a person of faith, I have absolutely no doubt that it was my angels who safeguarded me. Um, and I can see why my mom took the tack of out of sight, out of mind. She could not let herself think about where was I, what was I doing, or she would have been in an early grave. Um, but you know, we tend to, if we do have dismaturity, if we do have that's how you that, say it. Yeah. I've been calling it die maturity for the longest <clears throat> time because I could not pronounce it. Yeah. So dis dismaturity. dismaturity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I learned awesome. I, I've seen it written like a lot, but I've never yeah. been able to say it. Yeah. But you know, met a great many of us, I would say probably most of us have dismaturity to one extent or another. 
-hmm. And it's very uneven, right? I'd like say ninety five percent. Academically, mm -hmm. I I was above my peer group, right? Me too. Um, but socially, yeah, I wasn't there. And you know, for those of us who do struggle with dismaturity, for those of us who do struggle with cause and effect, right? If I do this, something bad may happen. <laughs> you know, if we struggle with that, whether it's putting yourself in, you know, being independent at too young of an age, in my case, or driving crazy fast for your, on, on your case, um, you know, if we're not making those connections, um, we do tend to even out and catch up developmentally, mm -hmm. right? For, for most of us, it's somewhere in our mid thirties, um, whereas the general population, it's probably mid to late twenties mm -hmm. when people kind of wise up. I always joke. It's when they realize their parents aren't stupid that they've finally grown up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, misguided perhaps, but, um, but not as stupid as, as adolescents think they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, I think having, um, parents really educated about FASD is, is huge. Um, and I think even for, you know, so many of, of the listeners and viewers to living with FASD are people like you and I who are living with this. Um, <clears throat> and we've had, you know, a variety of support from not nearly enough support to being fully supported. You know, our, our parents truly are all over the map with what they've brought to the table. Um, but we can offer everybody hope, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What is, um, what do you think is something that you can encourage people to do, um, whether it's parents or, let me digress for just a minute. Um, I was talking earlier about how parents have expectations that are often based on misinformation. But in reality, that's true for any relationship. You know, spouses can see each other through that same colored veil, right? Where their expectations are not based on reality. their spouse's reality, right? Their, their deficit deficits, I hate that word. Mm -hmm. um their struggles and their strengths um you know especially people who will say who speak in what's the word i'm looking for i can't think of it are you See? trying to ask uh what oh like extremes right um <clears throat> you always do this or you never do that right Mm -hmm. People that that see the world in those extremes, they tend to miss the reality of well, who it is that they love, whether it's spouse or child or friend or employee. Well, to be honest with you, people need to accept that there's a good uh, – if you believe 50 things, what people need to understand is probably 30 of those things are wrong. Mm. Um, a lot of people tend to believe mm -hmm. that what they think in their worldview is correct. Chances mm -hmm. are it's not. And what I recommend people do is ask questions, mm -hmm. join Facebook group, join support groups, and don't join just to share your experiences and be like, this is how it is. And when someone comments, yeah. don't just be like, and this is a comment I hear a lot. You don't know my kid. Yeah. Or yeah. this is how my kid interacts. That won't work for my kid because yeah. so, because this, 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 or we don't do that. I don't like that. That's yeah. what I hear a lot of mothers say. And then I'm like, okay, well, if you want to try the same things over and over again, just know yeah. you're going to get the same result yeah. because that's what will happen. That is a hundred percent what will happen. If you are doing everything a certain way and you keep doing it a certain way, you're going to yeah. get the same exact result a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. And when we are using a learning theory based approach, right? Which is compliance based, right? Um, it's the approach that says, if you offer the right reward or mm -hmm. threaten the right consequence, punishment, 
they will eventually make the choice you want them to make. Um, it doesn't matter what the carrot is or what the stick is. You're still on the hamster wheel going nowhere fast. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Very much. So. I love that <clears throat> analogy. And that's very true. Yeah. Um, sadly, you know, 50% of parents that do listen to this, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. They're going to go right back to, oh, I know what's best because the parents that think they know all that's best don't listen to advice. Mm. And if they hop off and just ignore this, their child's going to end up exactly how they would have ended up anyways. So I don't know why they'd even be watching. But the point is, is if you are listening and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I know better right now. No, you probably don't. And yeah. you need to accept that because otherwise you're going to get the result that you do not want. And I know deep down, you probably don't want that for your kid, but it's going to happen unless yeah. you make the change because it's not just on your kid. Your kid is a child, yeah. whether they're 18, 20, eight or eight or nine yeah. or 10. I don't care how old they are. They're still a child. Sorry. Um, and Unless you change how you are doing things, you are going to continue to get the same results as you're yeah. getting right now. I th I think one of the secrets, Patrick, is to be insatiably curious. Yes. You found that in your own journey. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going, I don't like this result. What's going to give me better results? Mm -hmm. What's going to get me to where I want to be? And that's the same insatiable curiosity that caregivers need, whether they're parents, spouses, whoever, um, <clears throat> you know, I, there's a saying that um, we use in, in facets that says we have to be willing to exchange our righteous indignation mm -hmm. for insatiable curiosity. And that really is golden because that's what gets us out of our own perspective and into the other person's. You know, instead of saying, what's wrong with my wife? What's wrong with my child? What's wrong with, you know, whoever? What's wrong with me? Yeah. What's yes. wrong with myself? Yes. Um, it, it can be, well, what's making it difficult? What's in my way? What's the obstacle? Too tall. You know, what's the struggle here? Um, and it's choosing to believe that all children will do well if they can. You know, there's a number of uh, psychologists that are very popular today that basically say that same thing. Well, the truth is, is your child has a peak. Mm -hmm. Your child has a potential it's capable of, okay? And whether you, decisions that you make, situations and environments you put them in will dictate whether they reach that peak or not. They could hit the peak. They could surpass the peak or they could really hit below their peak. Mm -hmm. And that choice is the parents in a lot of the ways, because their personality, all of their choices are going to be based again on the schools you put them in, yeah. the environments you put them in and the things you tell them and how yeah. you parent the child. Um, yeah. It is a lot more valuable for a child to be curious, for a child to mm -hmm. think, which is like what I said before. Don't tell your child what to think. Yeah. Tell them how yeah. to find out that information. Yeah. 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 Well, e even in the academic circles. You don't, no one teaches you how to think until you hit grad school. <laughs> Up until then, it's all about memorization. Yeah, well, memorization is a waste of time, in my opinion. Yeah. I hated yeah. school. I, I loved math, but usually I ignored the teacher, slept through the entire lecture, and just did the math problems because it was so boring. Yeah. And I had all the annoying questions kids would ask that I thought was a waste of time. Yeah. I would just sleep. Uh, I ended up being bored with most of high school. I didn't even go to class half the time in my first two years, mostly due to bullying. I got all of my four years of high school credits in my last two years because of an environment change, mm -hmm. because I went to a smaller mm -hmm. school where I actually yeah. liked the people. Yeah. That's how big of a difference yeah. uh, environment can be. Environment oh, where totally. I'm being attacked and bullied. I got zero credits for two years. Yeah. Uh, I transferred, got all four years of high school credits. Now, anyone that's been through high school, that's a lot of credits yeah. in two years. Yeah. Technically yeah. speaking, I graduated high school in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Because I actually tried. I I, I, yeah. I gave a crap. I tried. Granted, yeah. it killed my GPA for not caring my first two years, but, but what can I do? And, but look what happens when you are engaged. Yes. And right. you have and you have the right environment. But that's yeah. not probably the best example I can give a parent of environment changes everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
It totally 100%. does. And it's... I think, you know, we we can't put everything onto parents because they're a product of their culture. Yeah. Just, you know, just as we are and, and the culture changes. Yeah. But at the but... same time, <clears throat> if I'm put in an environment where I'm being violent, right, mm -hmm. where it, let's say, well, I would never do that, but let's, with how I am now, but let's say that I, uh, let's just say random FASD boy. Okay. Random FASD kids 18. Say we put him in an environment with a lot of loud noise, a lot of things, and he goes off and he beats somebody up, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that his environment was bad. He's going to get in some form of punishment, some sort of mm -hmm. trouble, okay? Parents' choices are the same way. Yes, they're a product of our, as you said, a product of our environment mm -hmm. and our culture. It doesn't matter. Well, I, I think the point I was getting at, Patrick, is, mm -hmm. you know, what I said a few minutes ago about um, learning theory perspective mm -hmm. where all behavior is chosen and it's a matter of motivation if you find the right motivation right the carrot or the stick then so and so will make the choice eventually that you want them to make because I it's, think it's all a... about choice and and until we move society away from that yeah because i was about to say that's a very flawed way of thinking but it's that's that is the belief that drives every system in our society. And that is why the world is as screwed up as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's not how people work. Because yeah. you don't it, just make a choice just because you want something. Right. Um or because you're afraid of something. Because I can tell you what, um that's just that's not the case. You yeah. Um, you're searching for thought. your thoughts. Yeah. Um, well, but you're totally right. <clears throat> um, it doesn't work, especially for people who are neurodivergent. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't take into account that nature nurture bit that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, where alcohol has changed our nature. Yeah. It is, it is well, changed a lot the way of people, our brains are hard. I think. I think one of the biggest issues is how we describe the disability to people. Because people, when they hear the term mental illness or neurological deficiency, they're, they have preconceived notions of how it works, or they think it's something that's just in the back end. And it's something that they can just control and have uh, certain functions over and they can pick and choose which symptoms show. But that's not the case. Right. Like, uh, it, like, let's say that there's a dad and uh, he's correcting his kid. He's so upset that she's talking out of turn in class. That's a wrong expectation. If mm -hmm. that child is a ch kid with an FASD and they're talking out in class or, or any neurological deficiency, autism, bipolar, ADHD, ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, your expectation should be, this child is probably going to talk out in front of class sometimes, but let's see what we can do to improve it. Yeah. But if you're just yelling at the child and telling them that's wrong, that is the worst way of parenting you can do. Yeah. Because yeah. one, the child's not going to understand why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Two, the child's going to do it anyways. Three, the child's just going to be convinced that they're just a bad child. When really, yeah. what the better way to do would be like figuring out, helping the child figure out why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Help them be aware that they're doing it. Ah. Set goals for them and work with them. See what the child wants. Because that child's not going to have that go away because you're upset. Right. Right. Because I can tell and you what, that child doesn't want to upset you. That child doesn't want to speak up and annoy her classmates. It does exactly. not, the child does not want to annoy the teacher. I can tell you what, any time I got in trouble as a kid, and I remember this fully, I never was intentionally trying to ever do anything wrong. I never mm -hmm. had bad intentions. Yeah. And I can say that I have like, I'm years away, away from school. Okay. Yeah. You know, when you're sitting that child off in the hallway, which I spent a lot of times with, I had my own spot. I had someone come by every day and say hi to me when I was in the hallway as a kid. Like, um, <laughs> I had my own desk in the office too. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you what, um, none of that helped at all. Yeah, absolutely not at all. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that was not a good way of punishing. I understand why the schools did it. I'm not yeah. going mad at the schools. I'm not name dropping yeah. the schools. I'm not saying the schools did bad things, but I am saying it, it did not work and yeah. it's not going to work. It didn't work yeah. 20 and, years ago. It's not going to um, work now. 
And and it comes down to the system, the educational system, having that same skewed premise, right? There's a lot of problems with that the behavior system. is chosen. Um, you know, and that belief system drives everything. It drives the judicial system, oh. social services, education. It's well, it's what we, parents are taught in parenting class. Well, the biggest problem is is the human's way of thinking is incorrect to begin with. One, we think everyone thinks the same. Two, so in school, we design everyone to follow the same rules, same strategies. Mm -hmm. Social rules in general are set in a way that uh, sets people up for defeat. The way schools are taught set people up for defeat. And we even set the teachers up for defeat. Mm -hmm. They make less than a McDonald's worker at this point. Like there's <laughs> no positives in the school. The current school yeah. system is so flawed. Honestly, we should just dig it up and throw it away yeah. and create a new one. Because no, we, we should teach basic math and English up to elementary school, fifth grade. Mm -hmm. figure out in middle school and high school what the kids want to do in high school train them for a skill mm -hmm. get them the classes that are related to said skill and passion and get them into the field help them find work that would be the best system you could have yeah for an education I, system and then raise the teacher's salary twice as much yeah to put into and, perspective like teachers make nothing i make twice as over twice as much as one teacher yeah they make no yeah. money and i have no college degree yeah I yeah. have certifications, um, but yeah. I You've had so many valuable things to share today. And I just, I'm so grateful that you did not hesitate to say, yeah, I'll come on and talk with you. <laughs> I think, um, I hope that everyone was inspired with, um, you know, being willing to step out of the box, right? That society keeps wanting to put us into. Um and, and to figure out what we what our gifts are and our talents are and how can we get there um, and how can we support our loved ones to get there, um, you know, to to their dreams and aspirations, not not those which we have for them. Um, <clears throat> hey, come on, you guys get out of there. Uh, What's the matter, buddy? We're friends. <laughs> oh, my little puppy's hiding behind the paper shredder going. Somebody wants attention. <laughs> I have a little dog but, myself, five pound Yorkie poo. Oh, yeah. He's this, really adorable. This little guy has filled us with so much light and laughter in the, the two months that we've had him. He's absolutely hysterical. Mm -hmm. um, his, let's see, mom is a Shih Tzu. And dad is a multi poo, so half Maltese, oh. half poodle. The poodle does and... they have the soft poodle hair? Like Moo Moo has like really soft hair, and it's like, but you have to. That get was the name hair. his the parent the family that raised him gave this dog was Moo Moo. Oh, my he... dog's named Moo Moo. She's a black and white Yorkshire Terrier mixed with a toy poodle, so she's really tiny. She's five yeah. pounds at full size. So oh she's my like goodness! A, and then when she was a baby, she was like this. She yeah. Could fit palm of your hand her legs yeah. were like this it was so cute but she's yeah. still adorable even as a yeah. full-size dog and i love her so much you should check out my pictures on facebook you'll see a I lot will of will do her. that i will All do right. that yeah Sounds no good. Our, my my little guy george mm has -hmm. <laughs> gotten george. into so much mist well you know when i when i got him i was thinking well i don't like moo moo i can see where they got it because his skin is is spotted uh, like a cow yeah but um yeah he's discovered digging in the in the mud yeah. yeah and getting a shower and blow dry he's not taught him anything he continues to do it my and dog then, does not like showers at all she fights me on it yeah um, george isn't a fan either and then then yesterday he discovered grabbing the end of the toilet paper and running oh no thankfully my dog can't reach it actually here i'm just going to send you this is from a year ago but it should be good this is my <laughs> dog and uh she is this is about a year ago i sent you on facebook okay yeah maybe if you want you can hold a picture up to the camera oh i can't because the other okay. monitors over here but i gotcha. sent you a picture all yeah. right <clears throat> well we've been talking for a while and i think it's time to wrap it up but patrick right, you have been a delight <laughs> well i'm glad <laughs> and... i hope uh, I, I know I'm very, 
uh, high strung. So okay. I hope that I didn't offend anyone too much. So I apologize if I did. Well, um, you have reasons for having the strong opinions that you do, mm -hmm. you know, and that goes to your history, which is entirely yours and no one can judge that away. Right. Mm -hmm. It's valid. It is valid as any of our experiences. And so I really appreciate everything that you've had to say. Um, I would and encourage parents who may have bristled from time to time to please remember that none of us knew what we didn't know until we learned it. Patrick himself said that his life changed drastically when he got good information on FASD when he was 22. And so getting that good quality education, eyes wide open, will make all the difference um, whether you are living with FASD, parenting someone with FASD, living with someone who has FASD, you know, getting that good information is, is where it's going to start really kicking in so that those relationships can thrive. And um, Patrick, I just, I thank you so much for joining me. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, everybody, I can't believe we're we're at the end of another episode already. I hope that, um, you know, send me an email to livingwithfasdpodcast at gmail.com. Let me know what you thought of the show. If you have any other, um, <clears throat> if you have any other topics that you would want me to get someone in here on, if you have any speakers that you think that I need to bring in um, to be a guest on the show, let me know those things. Um, if you have questions about FASD that you want me to answer, you know, I'll bring someone in and we'll hear what everyone has to say. But in the meantime, this is a good place to learn about FASD from um, both the professional and the living experience perspectives. And so I thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen in. And I pray that your day will be blessed. Come back next week for another episode of Living with FASD. Please remember to like, share, you know, I don't know what platform you're listening to, but, you know, there's a rating system somewhere. Um, but, you know, you don't be afraid to use that also. Um, and if you want, you know, remembering that I have both professional and living experience, if you want to have a trainer come in and talk about FASD, talk about how to support people with FASD, then reach out to me and um, I'll see how I can help you or your organization out. If you want coaching, whether it's um, as a parent of a little with FASD or whether you're a neurodivergent adult and you have never figured out methodically what your strengths and challenges are, if you want coaching around that, I can help you do that as well and develop those accommodations. Um, if you want a good book, <laughs> sit by sip candid conversations, uh, with people diagnosed as adults with FASD, it will show you the the wide variety of experiences that we've had, you know, and how and what our journeys have been um, discovering later in life that we're on the spectrum. Um, but for all those things, um, I thank you for your time. You have honored me and you have honored Patrick. I'm so glad you came. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week.